So what am I going to talk about today? So to begin with, I'm going to introduce you something called micro VMs and explain what they are. Uh, I'm then going to talk about the Liquid Metal project, which is maintained and sponsored by Weaveworks. Uh, I'm going to talk about why the Liquid Metal project and micro VMs is, uh, uh, are useful. And then I'm going to demo the thing. So let's begin with an introduction to micro VMs. So let me just expand my notes a little bit bigger. There we go. Micro VMs are exactly what they sound like. They are smaller VMs. They are a smaller subset of virtualization tailored for a specific need so you don't have any unnecessary overhead. Um, this makes them almost, almost, as fast to put up and tear down as containers. So if you think of your standard VM, it has to be ready to run any operating system for any possible use case. Use case. You don't know what people are going to throw at it. It's got to be ready for anything, uh, which means the hypervisor has to do a lot of work and allocate a ton of resources to accommodate any of these possible scenarios. Uh, with a micro VM, you tell the hypervisor to basically half ass it uh, and only set up the exact things that you need. So like, if you don't need any hardware device, devices or you need one or two, you only do those things. Um, so micro VMs are designed to give you the best of both worlds. So uh, VMs give you security, containers give you speed. Uh, so in this case, you have the speed of almost as fast as a container with the security of having your own kernel, your own operating system. I know containers have your own operating system, but here you have your own sandbox environments to do whatever it is that you like. Um, and because you're excluding a lot of unnecessary um, functionality, you have a lesser attack surface anyway. So those are micro VMs. So what is the liquid metal project and why are micro VMs relevant for it? So liquid metal are a, is a set of tools to declaratively provision Kubernetes clusters on lightweight VMs, so micro VMs. Um, so it, this is built and maintained and sponsored by Weaveworks and it's comprised of these four components that I'm going to go through uh, right now. So the first one is Flintlock. And I'm now regretting not having any notes here because I have to keep looking up to see what's on the slide. So Flintlock creates and manages uh, the lifecycle of micro VMs. So it's a gRPC service written in Go and it runs on a bare metal host. It can technically run anywhere, but here I'm talking about bare metal host. And you say, I would like a micro VM. I would like a ephemeral throwaway environment started up really fast to run a very specific use case. And Flintlock will handle that for you. Um, see, it's too small here. Uh, so this Flintlock can technically be used independently of liquid metal, and I actually do this myself sometimes if I want to create a micro VM real quick to run some tests, and I don't really want to use a container because it doesn't give me enough functionality for the tests I want to run, I'll quickly spin up Flintlock. But it is primarily designed to run Kubernetes nodes. And it works with cluster API provider micro VM. So CapMBM is a CAPI provider, it's an infrastructure provider, so when you're creating a brand new CAPI workload cluster, you say, I want to use CapMBM, I want to create my Kubernetes nodes in micro VMs on bare metal um, hardware. So this, as well as the Flintlock components, they're both open source uh, in the Weaveworks Liquid Metal organization. And yeah, that's all I've got on that slide, sorry again. <laughs> And then that comes to Firecracker and Cloud Hypervisor. So these are both open source uh, VMMs. Um, Firecracker is created by AWS, Cloud Hypervisor by Intel. Uh, they're written in Rust, and they're basically the core uh, process executors. They're the things that are creating the micro VMs. So Flintlock is wrapping either one of these two, so you can choose the one you want. And that this will, um, they're based on the KVM in Linux. And so Flintlock will call out to either one of these and create start a process which will run as a micro VM. And then on, once that's booted, you can then start your Kubernetes node. So the last component I want to mention is Containerd. You all know what this is. You've seen it in Kubernetes and Docker running containers and stuff. In our case, in Liquid Metal's case, we use it to pull down uh, images. So when you start your micro VM, you say, I want this kernel, I want these kernel modules, I want this operating system. Containerd goes and fetches those and prepares them for mounting into the micro VM. So let's just go through what I said, but with pictures. So this is me, you, whatever, uh, talking to a CAPI management cluster. Let's pretend it's on my Dell and it's a kind cluster. I've got CAPI controllers running, I've got CAPMVM running. 
And so I apply my manifest, and I say I want I know, three Kubernetes votes, whatever. I want a cluster. Um, Capium VM will look at my list of bare metal hosts, and it will go and talk to each one of them. And it will go and talk to Flintlock, the gRPC service, running on each of those hosts and say, hey, I want a micro VM. Flintlock will say, OK. It will go to container D, say, all right, I need this kernel, I need the, these kernel modules, and I, I need this operating system, go get them. Container D does that. Once that's down, oops, gone too fast. Once that's down, uh, Flintlock D will talk to Firecracker, and Firecracker will then boot the process. So it will start a, a process. It looks a lot like a container, actually, because as you know, containers are just processes. They're not actually real. So it, when you're looking at it on the command line, it looks like a process. So Firecracker will start the microVM process, um, at which point, um, I assume we all know how Cappy works, but Cappy will have set up some user data to bootstrap the machine into a, uh, into a Kubernetes node. That will run. The Kubernetes node has started. And then I can use it as like a cluster doing stuff, whatever you use your cluster for. Um, so use cases. Why would you want to use liquid metal? Why are microVMs cool? Why all of this? So these are all kind of related. So the first obvious one is edge computing. MicroVMs, they have a lower footprint, so you kind of can just use them at the edge. We have lower resource environments. Uh, that makes sense. Uh, similar, again, to number two. So I've got like a home lab here. This is my Raspberry Pi setup. I'm going to get onto that in a minute. I know this is why you came. You didn't come to listen to me talk about it. Like, it's coming. It's coming, I promise. Um, bare metal, again, these are all really related, I know. I was just trying to write the list, right? Um, and the last one is an actual practical use case, which is CI self-hosted runners. Because if you want to maybe run tests more efficiently, but containers aren't quite doing it for you, uh, this is actually a very practical use case. Uh, you don't have to do it on Raspberry Pi. Again, this is a toy. You don't have to do it on a Raspberry Pi, but you can do CI runners on actual larger uh, systems. So, demo. It's a fake out. There's more stuff. Don't worry. There's more slides. We'll get to the demo in a minute, OK? So yeah, this is the use case. This is a proof of concept. And I cannot stress that enough. It is a proof of concept that I wrote just for this conference. Um, so I'm using self-hosted GitHub Actions. And I've got a liquid metal cluster running on these Raspberry Pi boards. Um, so bare metal liquid metal cluster. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to run some example CI jobs on a mixture of ephemeral pods running inside my liquid metal cluster and dedicated ad hoc micro VMs. Uh, there are some links to people who are watching the slides later. So what components am I using? I'm using something called the Actions Runner Controller. Uh, this is an open source project. Um, I can't remember who started it. I believe it's sponsored by HelloFresh. It's now part of like the official GitHub Actions organization. At least I can surmise it is because I can see the URL moved. Um, and it's quite cool. It lets you uh, create like a runner deployment where you can have like a pool of ephemeral runners that are just in pods. They will be registered as runners in GitHub Actions. And when you start a job, it will run in the pod, and then it will self-destruct afterwards, and you'll get a brand new pod. Very exciting. The other component I'm doing, uh, this is the one that I made for, for this demo, is the MicroVM Action Runner. It's a proof of concept. Um, it's an HTTP service, and it responds to a GitHub webhook. So it will create ad hoc microVMs. So whenever you run a job um, saying that you want you know, a dedicated microVM, it will spin up a new microVM on one of my boards, run the job, and then kill it afterwards. Um, I had hoped to do this really nicely, like have a controller with some maybe hot pools and some scaling. But I quit WeaveWorks like a month ago, and then I haven't actually had time to do the thing. So I'm really sorry. You get the HTTP service, but you know, dream big. Imagine it's going to be really cool. Well, cooler. OK? This is, you know. So benefits. Why would anyone want to go through the hassle of setting up a separate CI system? Why not use Jenkins? Um, so there's a lot of benefits. I only had a certain number of space on the slides, so I'm kind of just crushing it all to one. So CI infrastructure is kind of, I don't know, when you think about CI infrastructure, it's kind of a bit of an add-on when you are in a cloud-native software shop. We use you know, Jenkins, we use Circle CI, we use GitHub Actions. And so it's kind of old-fashioned. There's a lot of traditional legacy infrastructure going on there, which is a bit of a bottleneck. Um, MicroVMs are actually sort of more performant. And because they have a lower overhead when it comes to setup, that you can get higher, you know, faster feedback on your tests, and you end up using, obviously, because they're smaller, you have a high utilization of your runner infrastructure. You're using more of the box that it's running on rather than starting up a huge VM, which takes up more room than it needs. 
um, and you, know, you end up your tests end up using very little of it. So traditional runners have a long wait for spin up times. MicroVMs reduce that. Um, Traditional CI provides speed at the cost of complexity and or safety, because yes, you can run your CI in, in Docker. I know GitHub actually gives you this, but it kind of encourages Docker and Docker, or encourages privileged host access and other workarounds, which isn't massively secure. Um, as I said before, micro VMs provide the flexibility of container builds with actual sandboxing. So you don't, doesn't share, they don't share kernels with a host, and they don't require any privilege. They have everything that they need to test all the crazy stuff that you're doing without anything interfering on the host. Um, CI infrastructure often requires that runners are available from a whole pool of nodes, because I know I said earlier, you know, traditional CI takes a long time to spin up, but you're thinking, no, it doesn't. I have my Ubuntu VM ready immediately. Yes, because there's a hot pool running all the time. Um, and if you think of, so GitHub Actions, for example, because that's what I'm using, I think they're using Azure or EC2 VMs, I can't remember which. They are running constantly to accommodate hundreds of thousands of builds a minute, probably. So this is stuff running all the damn time. Um, MicroVMs, you don't actually need that because they start fast enough that unless you need an answer within three seconds, you can wait 20 seconds for the thing to start, then run, and you're golden. You don't need all these massive VMs just waiting, spinning for something to pick it up. Um, and microvms let you test things that require low level things like init system, systemd, other you know, lower level kernel things. Um, containers, and, containers and many other CI runners don't let you do this. For example, when I was testing Flintlock itself on GitHub Actions, I couldn't because they don't enable the KVM. I couldn't do that, so that was a pain in the ass. But now we dog food Flintlock to test Flintlock itself, so I can test Flintlock on this, which is actually really neat. And other things if you're running tests in kernels like, like you've got an eBPF program. So you can run those in microVMs, but you can't run them in containers or a lot of traditional CI. So I need a drink now. Okay, there we go. Nikki, am I speaking slowly enough? Sorry, she needs to check for me. Okay. Um, other benefits are environmentally related. Um, because you've got faster build and start times, you're actually reducing your average time to results, so that's always nice. As I said before, warm halls aren't necessary unless you desperately want them. Even if you do have them, they're taking up less space, so you're using your equipment more efficiently. Um, and again, because you're using the right size environment, the smallest environment for your tests, you end up reducing the overall cost because you can fit more micro VMs onto the same hardware as you would regular VMs. Uh, build caches can be shared between uh, runners because they can be mounted, which ensures we're not constantly uh, writing unchanged dependencies to disk. Um, I know there are hacks and GitHub Actions and other things to do this, but it's not by design, it's a hack. And finally, um, just microvms require lower disk usage uh, in general because they basically act like containers. So you've got all the kernel layers, all the operating system layers being snapped off and shared. So you end up uh, having less on disk to begin with. Okay, here's another picture, still no demo for you yet. Um, I'm just reiterating what I showed you before so it's fresh in your mind. So. Um, what we've got here on the left is my uh, laptop, which is a Dell, running my Kime management cluster. It's running Cappy and Cap MVM. Then I've got four Raspberry Pi boards. Um, these are all Model 4Bs. They're running Ubuntu 2004, because that's one I like. They're four gigs of RAM um, with micro SD, so they're a little bit slower, simply because I didn't want to bring more stuff, like uh, SSDs on here. But yeah, we'll, we'll live with that, it's fine. So uh, three of these boards are running a liquid metal cluster, which I triggered before I got on stage, just because the demo was quite long already. Um, I've only done one node per board uh, because I don't want to. It's very. This is very low resource. Only four gigs of RAM. There's not a lot going on there. Uh, really small uh, micro SDs. Um, so I've done one node per board, not just not to push it. Um, and more importantly, this is fun. Again, this is fun. This is a toy. Don't use this in like a professional setting. Okay. Um, okay, some interesting stuff about the network if anyone cares. So when my VM start, they need an IP, naturally. Um, I could just, you know, connect it to something to, you know, let, let it connect to, uh, to the Wi-Fi and get some automatic, you know, allocated as they come up from the conference Wi-Fi, but I wanted to control it, so I have a DHCP server running on my Dell. Um, and the IPs are allocated from a private range in my dedicated VLAN, which is configured by this managed switch. Um, so each microVM gets a Mac VTAP interface with that IP, which is parented to the board's VLAN interface, which is parented to the board's Ethernet interface. 
traffic from and to VMs is then forwarded uh, via NAT rules which are configured on the Dell. So uh, any traffic coming in on the VLAN subnet uh, on these boards will get sent out through my uh, the Dell uh, Ethernet and then back again. Um, more pictures. So this is a zoom out of the hackery to get this working. Uh, and this is what nearly broke me this morning when I tested it out at 10 a.m. and it did not work because the network would not connect because my hack originally began, because I've done this at previous conferences before, uh, the hack originally began as a Wi-Fi extender which would connect to conference Wi-Fi and then I could plug in an Ethernet cable to the switch, then further Ethernet cables to all the boards in my Dell. But the Wi-Fi extender trick wasn't working. Fortunately, it was saved by the AV guys who showed me there was an Ethernet cable here. So the day was saved. You don't have to watch a recording because if you watch a recording, then how do you know it's using boards at all? It could just be using EC2 and it was all could have all been a fake out. Fully you know, it is a fake out now, actually. I could be using EC2. These could be lights that I just turned on. Like, you don't even know. Um, you can come find me afterwards to verify if you really want to. Um, so why, why did I go through all this drama? Why did I not just connect to the conference Wi-Fi and be done with it? Uh, four reasons. One, um, I wanted my own private network. I wanted to control the NAT traffic. I wanted to control the DHCP, the IP pool. I wanted it all to be private. Uh, second one is when the liquid metal cluster starts, it needs uh, the API server needs an IP. I need to know what that is in advance. So I couldn't go to DNS or whatever, so I couldn't exactly go and ask the conference people, can I look at your router to see where a free IP is in your pool? That would be awkward, so this way it's come from my private network, I know what it is, that's fine, it's fine. Um, the third reason is uh, I wanted to power the boards over Ethernet, so I'm using a power over Ethernet hat for each board. I don't want to have a mess of cables turning it on, so uh, each board is getting power and internet through the same cable, which is really cool. And the last one is as I said before, the micro VMs, when they start, they are created with Mac VTAP interfaces, and Mac VTAP interfaces do not work wirelessly. They require a wired connection. If you want to know more about that, come find me after. Uh, bring a cookie, and I will answer the question. Um, also, by the way, I apologize for this really attractive shoe box. I kind of wanted to lift it up to show it, um, and the shoe, my running shoe box is kind of all I had, so sorry about that. OK, so I created the cluster ahead of time. If you want to see how that actually works, I did. I demoed that in Kubernetes Community Days UK in November. And I should have linked it here, but I forgot. Really sorry. Um, so this is what I'm going to be showing. So the first job is going to be running in an ephemeral pod. So I'll trigger a job in GitHub Actions. I'll trigger a job in GitHub Actions, which will go to the action queue, which will be picked up by one of the runners, which was started by the action runner controller. It will run the job, self-destruct, create a new one. Easy. Uh, the next one, I will ask the job to be run in a dedicated micro VM. So I'll trigger the job in GitHub Actions. That will get picked up by a webhook, which will be sent to the micro VM service, which will talk to Flintlock on the top Raspberry Pi board. And um, it will create a dedicated micro VM registered as a GitHub Action runner for the job. It will run the job, it will self-destruct, and we're done. Um, by the way, the jobs that are going to run, I did have them initially running like Go tests, but then it you have to wait for like the Go stuff to download, and yeah, so it's just echoing like a string saying, congratulations, your tests pass. Um, so we get to feel good about it. Okay, yeah, let's, let's, let's demo the thing. Let's do it. That's the backup video, which you don't have to watch. So let me just, you know what, actually, I'm going to mirror now, I think, so I can see what I'm typing. No, that's not what I want. Can someone like hum a theme tune to something while I'm doing this? Just like some mood music? Where are my display settings? There we go. Mirror. That'll do. All right, I'm gonna, z how do I make it bigger? Like that? No. How do I, does anyone know how to work Ubuntu desktop? I don't usually use this. Not that. Oh, there we go. Zoom in. Be bigger. Is that big enough for everyone? Can people see stuff? Cool. Okay. So lucky you. This is all scripted, so nobody has to watch me type. So. 
I did this ahead of time, but I'm just going to show you what I did. So you, if you're following along at home, these are the commands that you do to get this up and running. So I created my Kind cluster. And yes, that's exactly how fast Kind gets started on this machine. Um, I then set some uh, cap MVM variables, and I've done my cluster cuttle in it. You all know how this works. And yay, that happened really fast. Not even Cert Manager took that long to install this time. Amazing. I'm setting some more uh, settings now for my workload cluster. So this is the cluster that will be applied. Let's pretend I haven't done it yet. That will be applied to my, uh, my Raspberry Pi cluster here. So there we go. I've set my IP. I've set my worker machine count, set my control plane count. Just one control plane, one, two workers, nothing massive here. I've applied it. And yay, it works. Cool. Let's have a look at what that is. So this is your workload cluster manifest if you're creating a CAP MVM cluster. Uh, most of it you already know if you've done CAPI. Um, key points are this is my list of uh, bare metal hosts. Uh, right now we've only implemented static pool allocation, so I had to actually name my addresses of where my Flitnock hosts are running. In future we're going to have some sort of clever scheduler where it will know exactly when you know, new machines come up and down so it can find those bare metal ones and put more nodes onto it. So it's, it's going to be cool. Um, other things to note is, oh yeah, I am using an image registry because this is not my first time doing a conference demo. I'm not doing a single image from the internet today. Um, so we see that we've got our replicas, we've got one control plane, we've got two workers, and here are some settings for our micro VM. So you can see that I've specified my kernel, I specified my operating system. So that's all very exciting. Let's go back out of there. What's next? Oh yeah, so this already exists, so I'm gonna go get the secret. And there are my nodes. And let's use canines to look at our stuff. So there is my liquid metal cluster running. Uh, we can go have a look at that actually. So these four panes are SSH onto these boards. Again, you're gonna have to trust me on that. That's not EC2, it's not anywhere else. It's, it's literally right here. It's these ones for real, okay? So that's definitely what's happening here. So uh, the top left is uh, the bottom one. So let's uh, Raspberry Pi zero. Then uh, bottom left, that's Raspberry Pi one. Top right is Raspberry Pi two. And bottom right is Raspberry Pi three. So I've got the control plane running here on um, Raspberry Pi 1, and you can see these are the boot logs of Firecracker starting the micro VM process. It's not massively exciting, it's just you know Linux booting. Uh, but here you can see that it was registered as a uh, Kubernetes control plane. Um, and then these other two things, that these actually are showing the directory structure of Flintlock state there. Um, it doesn't prove anything, it's just a directory, but this is how I sort of check to see where things exist at any given time. So we've got a worker node there and a worker node here. This one I've got, so Raspberry Pi 3 in the bottom right, I've got nothing going on there because that's the one I'm gonna to use to do ad hoc micro VMs in just a moment. So let's go back here and let's use our cluster for stuff. Obviously I'm gonna bootstrap it with Flux. I'm not gonna sit here manually applying manifest to my cluster. Um, so this is where we actually put the network to the test. So uh, what this is gonna do, it's gonna install the Flux components uh, it's going to install the action runner controller or the arc. Oh, there it goes, stuff doing again, local registry. Uh, it's also going to install the micro VM uh, service. And yeah, so talk amongst yourselves. It should be quite quick. Um, and luckily, it's behaving today. Cool. So all components are healthy. So I do, did this with Flux because I was in a hurry to get it working. Um, you could use uh, something else. Um, there's lots of GitOps tool like Weave GitOps that you could use to, uh, to, to, to do this, um, which will give you some nice visualization as well. Um, so that's the cert manager coming up. The action run controller will use that. And let's give it a moment. I should have had some like background music for this. A 
at least my canine's color scheme is pretty, right? So there comes the Actions Runner controller. I think down the bottom, yeah, so the Micro VM Action Runner down there at the bottom is already running, so that's cool. Um, just need to wait for that to begin, and then it will deploy some uh, runner pods whenever it gets around to it. There we go. And now, if we jump back to, not that, go away. Where's my internet? There we go. Uh, if we go back here, uh, what do I actually want? So I want my, not there, action runners. So there are no runners configured yet. So if we keep an eye on this, we'll see runners eventually pop up. How am I doing for time? Okay, I'm fine. What's, what are you doing? Okay, nothing, it's doing nothing. Great. What are you up to? I don't know, it's got everything it needs. Just thinking about it. Things I wanted to show you the pod one first because it's less exciting than the micro VM one, but the micro VM one is actually ready sooner. Conundrum. What else can I show you while I'm waiting? Do you want to see some network interfaces? Yes, no, yeah? Okay, let's do that, let's look at that. I bet as soon as I click over, it's gonna magically become ready. Okay, so if I control C out of there and I look at that. So as I said before, um, so this is on Raspberry Pi 1 here. Um, so this is the VLAN interface there, uh, which is parented to the uh, general ethernet port. And then here we can see there are two interfaces that were created for the micro VM. So one is the Mac VTAP interface here uh, that was created and parented um, to the VLAN interface. So this is what the, where the micro VM gets its you know, IP and internet access and all that. And um, this is another one which I think is actually the metadata service. I can't really remember. I think it's that. There we go. Now it's, no, it's not ready. God damn it. What are you doing? Fine. I'll do the micro VM one first. Be like that. Oh, wait, no, it began. Okay, fine, fine, cool, it's fine. Everyone focus up again. Okay, stop doing, get off your phones. Cool, so we've now got a micro VM, we've now got a pod runner. There it is. It's offline, get online. So this is actually something that I learned while I was doing this is GitHub is, I mean, you all know this, not massively reliable, right? Which is a great thing to use for a live demo with lots of moving parts, very high risk. Anyway, let's, tr let's trigger a job and hope it comes up eventually. So we go here, I wanna run an arc workflow. So what this is gonna do is gonna create a pod, no, a pod already exists, it's gonna run the job in the pod that should be online. Be online, there we go, it's active, it's running, it's running the job, how exciting. So if we look at that, it's actually gonna be really quick because it's literally echoing a line. Um, so this is running inside the, um... yes, thank you. I was quite pleased with that. Seats, yeah, okay, the job already won, already ran, and yes, I am awesome, so they passed. Right, let's go on to the next one. So if we go back into here, you'll see that the original pod is uh, destroyed, and now we get a new one coming up. So that's, that, that's fine, this running, you know, a test in a pod on a liquid metal cluster, that's less exciting. We're gonna now look at the micro VM, the ad hoc micro VM one. So we're gonna go to run test with micro VM, run that, do a thing. So that's gonna start, and if we go to here. Oh yeah, the previous one died, don't worry about that. Um, it should come back though. So that should be running there. Oh no, you know what I forgot to do? I forgot to port forward the service. I could've been doing that while it was waiting. God damn it, do the thing. I don't know if it's gonna pick up what I did, so I'll just trigger it again, why not? Do it again, do the thing. Please work. I still have like Ngrok. I'm doing a hack. I'm using Ngrok to you know, manage the service and the webhook because I can be bothered to set up DNS. And I really hope that works. 
it's did done something. I wouldn't worry about that 502 because that's just because I, oh yeah, there we go, created micro VM. You will get to watch me have a panic attack in real time. And now if we look at Raspberry Pi 3 down here, we can see that a new micro VM has been created just for this job. If we go back to our runners, we can refresh that. And now we have to wait for the micro VM to boot, the GitHub action runner to register itself, which is reliant on the GitHub action API, which is just what you want. So if we go here, we can actually watch it boot all the way down to Firecracker standard out. Follow that. It seems to think it's fine. Go up. Yay, it did a thing. Runner successfully added, though where are you then? There we go. Oh, it's active, it's already been picked up. See, literally, I click away and it's fine. It's doing its thing. Do the next bit. Wait, did it already run? I didn't, there we go. Yes, there we go. My test pass on a dedicated liquid metal VM. The runner should have self-destructed. Oh, don't worry, that's the pod that came back really slowly. What was that doing? And if we look back here, my micro VM should be being deleted. Oh no, it failed. Never mind. let's pretend that didn't happen. It's all cool, right? Don't worry about it. Okay, I think that's the demo. <laughs> How do I get to the next screen? There we go. <laughs> okay, you did that earlier. I've actually got a slide that tells you when to applaud. <sighs> okay, so learnings. As I said, GitHub is not in the least reliable. Um, a couple of times when I was testing this, I hit a known issue where runners were available, jobs were triggered, and yet they didn't, didn't notice them at all. Um, so I was sat there and I was like, okay, when's it going to pick up? Then I would go and do a chore in the house. And then 20 minutes later, it's like, oh, now the job runs. Excellent. Well done, GitHub. Um, so there are a couple of moments I was like, should I be using GitHub to do a live demo like this? I went for it anyway. Um, when I was experimenting with all this, I wrote a 40 page document analysis on how this could be more efficient than running, not this, not a Raspberry Pi, but a general bare metal liquid metal setup could be more efficient than using your standard enterprise CI package. And theoretically, it is more cost efficient if you set it up carefully. But again, there's then the overhead of ma maintaining it. So it's kind of, you know, swings and roundabouts is whatever your organization can afford to do. But it is, I don't know if you noticed, but I keep seeing loads of comments saying, we're moving away from cloud, we're back to on-prem. It's like, really? We're sort of going back to, to that time? It seems to be hot these days. So um, I think this is a really interesting thing. Um, there's lots of other tools that are coming out that are using micro VM technology. And uh, liquid metal is, is one of those options. Now you can clap. Um, so here's some documentation. The one on the left is how to get this build. Uh, the one on the right is the liquid metal documentation. Um, you can run liquid metal on any bare metal service. Uh, I test it on Equinix sometimes, or I test it on my Raspberry Pi setup. Um, but yeah, that's all I've got for you. And I am literally 30 seconds until the end, so there's no time for questions, which I'm devastated about. Come and find me afterwards. Thank you so much.